evening and please welcome to the stage for day three, Peter Schlosser. Good morning everybody to day three, the last day of three really wonderful days. I think the city is taking its toll on the, uh, on, on the audience here, but uh, I'm sure people will filter in as we are underway. As we had during the first two days, we have uh, a nice uh, lineup of people for must-do panels, for spotlights, for catalyzing change sessions, and for work sessions. And of course, we hear so many wonderful thoughts during the panels and the spotlights, etc., that we hope that in the work sessions we are able to extract quite a bit of that and add additional thoughts to pull that together towards what we call the action space, actionable items. So we are really looking for, in the, in the work sessions, for ideas that relate to how can we take all the thoughts about what do we need to have, what do we have to do to get to that, to how are we really doing that? Where are the examples that we can take as a starting point that we might have ideas how to scale them, other new ideas of actionable items that seem to be realistic in terms of how we know the world works. So as you are going through the work sessions today, please think about that and, and really push towards the actionable items that we want to pull together then. We will end the day with a, what is called a, a synthesis session where we are reflecting upon last year's conference, this year's conference, and project ahead in terms of saying, what can we do together to take all the information that we have collected and move it into an actionable space? Create a joint voice among all the partners. We have more than 30 partners by now. And say, how, how are we actually creating that voice, that joint message, and how are we actually then bringing it into the discussion at other venues, in other circles that deliberate about the future. So with that, we will move on and start our first must-do's panel being introduced by Jason through the voice of God. Thank you, Peter. Leading today's first must-do discussion, please welcome Vice President and Head of International and Multilateral Affairs at Bayer AG, Helga Flores Trejo. I hope this is on. Yes, wonderful. Thanks to the voice of God uh, this morning. Very nice. Oh, no, center, please. Well, indeed, uh, Peter, thank, thank you very much. We start with a must-do that it's all about complexity for me. The must-do that we will be discussing today is reconnecting planetary health with human health. So it's all about biodiversity and ecosystems, climate change, and our human health. And this is a complex rela re relation. Now, let me start by saying, if you will, maybe three examples of how they, the, those three connect and the relevance they have for us today. Last year, we were all still very impressed by the pandemic, by COVID-19. So the first question is how these changes in degradation, biodiversity loss, and climate change increase the challenges of epidemics and pandemics. Second, I think this day, this year especially, we just received the NASA published the report, the hottest year ever recorded for the world since the recorded started in 1880. And we have seen in Europe, in the US, in India, tremendous impacts of that. Just to give you a couple of them, in Europe it is, it is uh, thought that about 60,000 people died from heat-related causes. 
in three states in the United States, Arizona, California, Nevada, the, there was an increase in hospitalizations by 51% related to heat. All, and I'm talking about all about this summer. 170 million people were under heat alert in the US. In India, in March of this year, about 60% of the country recorded higher than, uh, than average heat days. And this is a major impact for women especially that are out there in, 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 in the, in the uh, as, as they work um, and, and try to earn a living. Um, so that was a special, especially interesting for me to read or, or dramatic for me to read. So a, a true silent killer heat. Third example, the increase of vector diseases expanding their geographic impact. I remember last year I was here and I heard the presentation of Alex Degan that is somewhere, somewhere here. And Alex, uh, last year you said it is, uh, it is expected that by 2080, dengue will reach New York and DC. I live in DC so that, was, that made an impression in me. But, but this year, we already had the first locally transmitted malaria case in Maryland and dengue cases, locally transmitted dengue cases in Europe. So 2080 is probably too far ahead. I actually probably we are already there. So this shows you just the complexity, the relevance, and the need, in my opinion, to understand how ecosystems, climate, and human health really impact each other. Tremendous complexity that I'm very happy to have. Two uh, tremendous and amazing women here to help us, to help us think think it through. Let me first introduce Lisa Hensley. She leads Zoonotic and Emerging Diseases Research Unit at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. But she's a, she comes from having worked before as a researcher and associate director at the National Institute of Health before working at, uh, after working at uh, FDA on regulatory science. Second here, uh, Dr. Jamala Mahmoud really, as a medical doctor, obstetrician, has two decades or more of working in the intersection of health related to humanitarian crisis and on policy. And advancing policy and doing things. She's the executive director of the Sunway Center in Malaysia, has been a senior fellow at the Adrian Ashe and Rockefeller um, Resilience Center in Washington, DC. And interesting also in your field of action, I, I believe, a uh, board member of Roche, for example. So you're really connecting in different fields and different areas, I think something that I know Peter cares very much about. So to start on these must-dos, and as we know, the challenge that the Global Futures Conference uh, uh, posed to, to us was how to. Tell us how to, what to action. So but let, let me first start, Dr. Mahmoud. What worries you most of the re relation of climate change and health? Thank you very much, Helga, and what a pleasure to be here. Um, if I could just spend a moment to maybe put some terminologies into a context. Mm -hmm. When we talk about planetary health, it's the, probably the latest development in global health, and that is the relationship between the health of the planet and the health of human civilization, not just human health. It's human civilization. So uh, it, it would be erroneous to say planetary health and human health. It's all one thing. So just to put that uh, clarification. What worries me about climate change and health? The fear and of the unknown. What we know today is probably the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we think about health uh, in a very broad perspective. And what we are listening to now is about infectious diseases and so forth. But the, we don't talk enough about the impact of pollution on Alzheimer's and other diseases. We don't even know what microplastics are going to do to all of us when it's already evident in 
breast milk in, fe in infant feces and in the blood of up to 80% of samples taken. So there is so much we can't cope with and so much that's coming our way that we're not prepared for. So it's highly appropriate that we start you know, focusing on climate and health and it's already now you know, in the corridors at the UN, here of course, and at COP28 because for the first time health has become, health and crises have become mm -hmm a feature at the COP. So it's a, it's a tremendous moment for us here, and I congratulate you, Professor, for bringing this on board and the work that you do. So that I have a lot of things to say about this report and, and what you're doing, but I just want to say that that complexity means we are dealing with polycrisis, colliding crisis, and business as usual doesn't work. So you need to have really massive system shifts uh, that are, as you know, very difficult, but not impossible. And the second thing is that, you know, no better time to start than now. You mentioned this is the hottest month. It will be the coolest for the next 10 years. Hmm. Tremendous. Lisa, what about you? Hi, what good. worries you? Good, good morning. Helga, thank you, and thank you for the lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, what worries me most? It's a wonderful question. Um, I think what worries me more than anything is there seems to me a lack of awareness about emerging diseases. COVID taught us all that viruses will jump species. Pathogens will jump from animals to humans. But we seem to have missed the fact that they will jump back. Viruses and pathogens will go from, they'll spill back from humans to animals. And they'll also go between animals. And so why is this important? When you think about our interconnected world, it's not just human health, but imagine the virus or the pathogen that spills back. And we heard Alex talk about multiple examples with COVID, but a virus that spills back into a different species or with every replication of a pathogen in a host, there's an opportunity for that pathogen to change. So the impact of losing an entire species, the ripple effect of that, will be tremendous. And I think we're not recognizing that. We're so focused on that one event, we're forgetting how interconnected we are. The other part of this that I think is very important is the fact that we are seeing climate change. And that climate change is impacting not just the human health, but the animal health. And that may create more spillover events. And again, building on this cycle of interconnectedness, we heard about pollutions, and it's a wonderful point. One of the things to build on that is the fact that as you have infections, as our bodies withstand damages, challenges, now we need to understand the impact of pollution. So that cycle that it will continue to occur from environmental insults, from infectious disease insults, they're going to build on each other. And we need to find out how to break those cycles. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Let, let's go now into the doing. And one of the must do's identified, uh, if I can go from this complexity to the frameworks that we know, is the legal, working on the legal frameworks uh, that will tackle all these areas that you mentioned. So the question first um, to you, uh, Lisa, based on the legal frameworks we have as of now, we saw also COP15 last year uh, advancing uh, that discussion on biodiversity laws, um, the WHO with a One Health approach. Are there enough? If not, what is missing? And I'll ask also Dr. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud too. So your question is wonderful timing. When I opened up my email this morning, I saw that in the Federal Register there was a notice for review of a national framework to address zoonotic diseases and advancing public health preparedness. Um, so perfect timing. If you haven't looked at that, please take a look at it. Um, but when you ask me, are the frameworks enough? I think the frameworks are great starting points. And, and I'm not taking anything away from the amount of work that has gone into it. But I think those frameworks they're lacking some of the points that I just made. They're lacking the focus on understanding 
zoonotics not just from animals to people, but across different species and the potential impact that it could have. The other point that I think is missing from some of these frameworks is how to implement them across multiple cultures and how mm. to make them appropriate and how to ensure that there are sufficient resources to actually move these things forward and the resources are allocated in a way that makes sense. And I know my, my panel wants mm -hmm. to pick up on this point, so I'll pause there. Uh, no, absolutely. Dr. Mahmoud, yeah. you've been trying to do that exactly, applying and learning from that, so please. Yeah. So the first thing I will say to your first question is, do we need more legislative frameworks? I think inevitably, inevitably we do, right? Mm -hmm. But what is very important now is that we have to think about what we already have that is sometimes not connected, right? Down the road, they're talking about sustainable development goals, they put a target. Um, you know, as someone said to me, the minute you put a target and a date, people kind of think they have time. And, and I think it, we're, we're feeling it now because the SDGs are not being met, right? But more importantly, let's look at the building blocks that need to be there before you actually get into a, into a legislative framework or some position. One is governance, political will. Without that, no matter what frameworks you put in, you're not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. The second is very effective communications. Sometimes the jargon and the science does not connect with what policymakers or people on the street understand. Uh, so I think, you know, even the word climate, climate and health, what does health mean? To a young person who is healthy, he's not going to be concerned about health, he's more concerned about his performance. So if we can communicate that climate change will have an impact on your performance, your looks, uh, you know, that is all part and parcel of health. So it's about how do we communicate the science? The third is education. You know, how do we filter this down right from, you know, kindergarten education to university? So these are the things we have to. Now what about the must do's? I can only tell you what we are doing already because we can't wait for frameworks and legislative you know, mm. uh, policies and so forth to happen. So I come from Malaysia, middle income country, kind of caught in the middle income trap, but we've been pushing very, very hard. And what's happened at our university level is that from 2024, every undergraduate entering the university must pass a seven-week course on planetary health and community service before they graduate. So they do a, a three-week course on planetary health understanding and they apply it through the discipline that they're doing, whether it's edu ed education, engineering, medical science, communications, culinary arts. They need to know how to apply planetary health principles in the work that they do so that we hope as they become leaders and educators and policy makers, they will make the right decisions. The second thing we've done is push the government at the highest level, the Prime Minister chairing the committee to develop a national planetary health action plan, the first in the world, so that we try to break the silos. And this is exactly what's happening, even within the health sector. Go down the road to the UN, there's a special high-level panel on tuberculosis, one on malaria, one on universal health care. No mm. one's coming together to say, hey, it's all part and parcel of the same thing. Why? Because of the incentives. And now with climate, I will warn you that every single one of these agencies will try and hook on climate financing and find a way in, rather than saying, let's have a one you know, systemic approach mm. to addressing the real challenges we as people face. So bottom line, what I will hope that you leave today is this message. It starts with people. We have to see what people need where they are. And where you see what they need and where they are, the solutions could be local. The solutions could be simple. And then build up. Because at the end of the day, it's not about pleasing a policymaker. It's about making sure we need the needs of people who are the ones affected by the climate crisis. So, amazing. S starts with people. So what I hear is putting our efforts while not missing the framework and putting our efforts on education, political will, communication. But I have a question to you because both of you talked about maybe the unknowns. So is it in science and research, is there also an important action item that we need to advance um, also? And maybe Lisa and then uh, Dr. So, absolutely. 
Um, there is so much that we don't understand about the interconnectedness between um, the environmental insults that we're suffering and the infectious disease insults. That is a great question. There's also questions that we don't understand about how heat, how the changes mm. that we're seeing is going to change how we respond to infectious diseases. I, I alluded to this in my opening comments that when we have an infection, and, and I'm sure all of us have had a cold that maybe lingered or um, were stressed and we got an infection and we, you know, we felt run down. But as we go through more environmental stresses, to me, I always think of it as whenever that infection is there, the longer it's there, the more opportunity that pathogen has to change to adapt to that person or to that species. And so as we suffer these environmental insults and it takes us longer to clear the infections or it takes the species longer to clear the infections, are we at risk for new pathogens or worse pathogens? And so we really need to understand how these interactions are happening. And then the other thing that we absolutely need is better surveillance, active surveillance. We heard a bit about how mm. vectors are changing. We know that there's different distributions of the insects that carry Chagas disease. We know that distribution of ticks are changing. Are we monitoring that? Are we getting ahead of the curve of understanding how that will contribute to new diseases? and how those new diseases or how re-emerging diseases will spread. And so those are things that I think are easy ones for us to begin to address, both as social scientists as well as laboratory scientists. And the other point that I will make is, I think one of the areas that we can also do, we talked a little bit about education and the importance of education, but I also want to make a pitch for community scientists and engaging the community in science. And what we've learned over the years is that when you engage the community, it does a few things. One, it removes the fear, it removes stigma. And then it also creates buy-in. People become invested in being part of the solution, in being part of the science. And by using community science, I think that that's something that we can do right now to start looking at changes in the environment, changes in different species, and to collect that data. I'll pause because I'm getting on Absolutely my agree with you, Lisa. <laughs> Absolutely. I think citizen science, community science mm -hmm. is part and parcel. But we're sitting here in the Global Futures Conference. This is where, you know, there are like-minded individuals with access to science, to data, to technology. We are not short of knowledge and experts. So I'm an optimist. I have to be a determined optimist because I think that the solutions are with us. But we just need to find a way to connect the dots. And I think this attempt, right, the 10 must have, 10 must do's, is gold dust. I mean, this is where we need to amplify, grow, you know, and, and just keep collaborating and bringing different aspects of science uh, and community knowledge and policy making uh, to the fore. But, you know, it, it's not impossible. Uh, and, and to your question on, you know, how now do we look at the next 30, 50 years, people are already doing it. You know, there are future lab, futures labs that are already looking at the science, looking at the data. You know, the stuff that was described yesterday around the use of satellite imagery, uh, understanding, you know, these changes in topography and, and so forth, the, the AI that's with us uh, as well. So predictive science is already here and it will only mature and become more sophisticated and hopefully more, much more accurate. Hmm. So, so we're not short of science. What we need now is the willingness to collaborate, to then turn that science into concrete, actionable uh, you know, policies as well as uh, activities on the ground. I want to build on what you said about surveillance, because this is critical. Let's reflect on the pandemic. South Africa announced that it had, uh, I think at the time was a Delta virus. Hmm. What did the world do? Close shut their doors mm -hmm. to South Africa. What did South Africa, why did South Africa do that? Because they had the ability to do the genomic sequencing and were so accountable and transparent in informing mm. the world that there was a new virus. The world treated them like some pariahs. Mm. So the whole issue around pandemic, the pandemic treaty, right? The whole thing that's being negotiated now, which is failing is being watered down. I, I belong to a group called the Global Panel for Public Health Convention. And all we're asking for is accountability. 
monitoring, you know, a, a transparency. This is critical because only then do we get ahead of the curve in understanding what are these viruses that are, are going to, to hit us. We know that the glacial melts, you know, the, what's happening in the Arctic is going to impact us as well. We don't know, you know, it sounds like some sci-fi movie, but what are the things under ice now that will be released? We have no idea. So I think that degree of transparency, accountability, sharing of information, but not to the expense of disincentives for those who choose to be held, account or held accountable and to be transparent. So again, it comes back to governance and political will. So this is really you know, central to what we do. Can I build on something there? Please. Yeah. I wasn't sure if we'd have time, but what you're talking about is something that we often refer to as psychological safety. And we use this um, a little bit about my background. I spent most of my career working in high containment laboratories. And so there's this need when you work in that environment to feel that you can report an accident, that you can report a mistake, and you can do that without mm. penalty. And what we, the example you gave, and we see this played out over the years multiple times, a fear of a country or a group to report the presence of a new disease or the presence of a re-emerging disease and the concern about will their borders be shut? How will it impact trade? We see this on the animal side. Farmers afraid to allow people in to do surveillance. So that point that you're making within our frameworks, creation of psychological safety, is so important if you're ever going to have transparency and if you're ever going to make a positive change on M reporting. And, and who, who needs to do that? <laughs> to me, it's who a needs culture. To, who needs to act here? Yeah, it's a, to me, this is a culture shift. We're it's talking a, a little mm, bit about must-do's, mm, right? Mm. And, and we've talked a little bit about education, but to me, it's about creating the culture. It's creating about a culture where we prioritize planetary health, it's creating a culture, I use kindergarten rules, right? It's part of one of those early rules that you're taught about how you should act, how you should engage. And to me, the idea of psychological safety is community driven. It is mm -hmm. the response of the governments, the scientists, and we need to create a tipping point. I think you made a point um, when we were talking before about we have to become in, in we ha the balance has to shift enough where we demand this. And I think that this is something that has to occur at the level of the scientist, at the level of the citizen, at the level of the government official. But in any case, what I hear from both of you, there are many actions that communities and individuals can take. We're not asking a global, we're not, we, we don't need to wait. Now, let me, let me just move to the second uh, to the second must do that I wanted to raise today I know we don't have much time but everything you lay out also calls for health systems that are, are not only have the science are able to capture the early warnings the monitoring take action serve their citizens provide access all that in times where uh, in most of the developing countries, neither financial space, probably political will, uh, also complicated. So, Dr. Jamala, you manage to do, as you said, have government commit to say they will do the first planetary health report. Tell me a little bit about some of the health resilient in the systems that, that you, you, you some, some of the lessons learned, and some of the lessons learned of how you focus political will to get something like that started. It requires determination, right? I think, <laughs> you know, that's the only word I, I will say. Well, at the same time, it was an opportunity because I was also involved in the transformation of the health system, so building a health white paper for the for the for the mm -hmm. parliament um, to be presented uh, for approval, and that is a process. So planetary health is embedded in that. So I think the other thing is how do you make the case to policymakers? At, at the end of the day, it's finance. We've got to work with financial institutions, people who understand the numbers, to be able to demonstrate that it is in everyone's interest, from policymakers, politicians. Uh, you know, scientists and all that to actually take this very seriously because the cost of not doing it is too high. 
So, you know, that, that cost of doing nothing is just too high a price to pay. And we've got to capitalize on the fact that we've all gone through a lived experience of a pandemic, where we've seen how it's impacted our lives, our society, our economies, and so on and so forth. And finally, I want to say, we have to talk about equity because what applies here may not apply in many other parts of the world. Mm. And you know, until and unless we address that loss and damage uh, question, loss and damage not just for people who are, you know, countries that are caught in crisis and, and who are low income, but also middle income countries, because they've got to recover and we've all got to be, you know, wanting to have this at some degree of equity. Um, so it's not a one size fits all. Uh, but, you know, we have building blocks that we can learn from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa, you, you are now in the, agri in the agricultural side, and, but come from exactly from health system. Tell me a little bit about some of the challenges or the must-dos to have resilient health systems. In your experience, again, it's not one size fits all, but the learnings that you can share. Thank you. Um, these are really good questions. Um, so my background, uh, uh, most of it has been spent working in overseas in low resource countries, um, responding to public health um, challenges. And so over the time, one of the most important things that I have learned is to, when you get there, to ask, how can I help? What do you need? And that very simple question and coming in and looking, not assuming that I know what a country needs or what an approach should be is so important. I have seen time and time again where a group comes in with the best of intentions, but the measures that they're trying to implement are not acceptable. And if anything, it offends or it drives the community away. And so access to health care and quality health care is not just an issue, though, in low resource countries. It is a global issue. It's something that we face right here in the United States. And so the one thing that I have learned is that it's important that healthcare approaches be designed and strategies be designed to address the needs with the cultural, religious, social backgrounds to make sure that they're appropriate. When you don't do that, you compromise the individual's dignity. And when dignity is compromised, they turn away from the healthcare system. And that is, once that happens, it's a challenge to bring back. So that would be my one piece of advice. Mm -hmm. And then also to recognize the second would be, it's a long process. And it is not something that you're going to solve overnight. And you need to make continued commitments to have lasting impact and to rebuild trust to have the change you want. I, I want to spend at least one minute or so before we, we, we have the closing on the systemic question, and you mentioned finance, and that's one of the catalyzers. And I think the pandemic maybe brought a little bit of the sense in the world that health is not a cost, but an investment in your people, etc. But are there things we need to, are there new instruments? How could we move that needle to get the financing needed from development banks, from others? to understand exactly the investment in health. In, in, any thoughts uh, since we mentioned finance? <laughs> I mean, there's a, a, so much data uh, available around how much finance and money there is, right? If you look at, <clears throat> for example, military spend, uh, you know, it's in the trillions. Mm. If you want to actually, you know, tackle climate change, it's not impossible. The, f the money is there. It's about, again, where you put the money to good use, right? So again, I agree, go back to governance and political will uh, and calling to account, uh, you know, what needs to be done. The other thing, of course, is partnership. I think this is where private-public partnership is key. Mm. Um, there, we're not short of innovative approaches to financing. Um, and I think, you know, in my country, certainly, we have used some of these innovative approaches to look at, you know, what bonds can be developed during the pandemic, for example, to meet the needs of people. Uh, you know, social impact financing and so on and so forth. So we, I think that this is where the people in the room to talk about climate and ha health have to be beyond the health sector. We need to have these discussions in 
in meeting rooms, at board level, at you know, at fi the financial uh, Wall Street, you know, th those kinds of places, uh, because this is going to impact everyone. Th thank you, and, and and this is what what I like about global futures exactly bring breaking those silos and bringing us all of us together. We have time for a closing, and I want to concentrate on the following. For me, it, it cannot be that we can put a rover in Mars, but are not able to solve this when it comes to our own survival, right? It cannot be. <laughs> so for you, closing remarks, and I'll start with Lisa and then go to you, Mahmoud. What is the call to action for all of us here? And where, how do we grasp that creativity, imagination, science, and, and ability we know we have? Lisa first, and then we'll go. So for me, um, trying to think about, in my last minute here, things that I would think about. Um, health is a basic right. Access to clean air, access to clean water, these all need to be seen as rights, basic human rights. And I think we all need to think about how we can contribute to the change. And we've thrown out a lot of ideas, but to me, I'm sitting here in this conference, and what are the mo what are, how can we translate this into action? And how can we translate this into larger action? And how can we translate into immediate action? So just tossing out a few things. I mentioned the CFR. Everyone can go there and comment. We are all educators. We can all educate. We can all demand and increase awareness. Those of us who are scientists or who are politicians or who are leaders demand diversity at the table. Bring in people from different groups because they will lead to creative solutions. And don't be afraid to partner. We are certainly all in this together. And by building these partnerships, we will probably develop better solutions and we'll execute those solutions in the last minute. <laughs> Dr. I completely agree with everything Lisa is saying and I'm gonna add a couple of things that maybe we haven't discussed enough. Who are people listening to? I think we need to bring the influencers in, uh, you know, because whether you're young or you're old, the society has evolved and very much influenced by the influencers. I come from Asia. You may have heard of BTS. It's the number one pop group in the world. They have something called BTS Army, and they're all environmentalists. They're all talking about the environment and climate change. We need to get them to talk about these things. Um, so I think it's about who is delivering the message as well. In a world where actually there is a trust deficit, um, and we need to now, you know, it sounds very philosophical, but how do we reset our values? Uh, and that, you know, encompasses human rights, but also basic decency and, and wanting for others what we want for ourselves. The other thing I would say is a to-do that's very easy. Is let's keep amplifying GF23 outcomes. I invite you, Professor Schlosser, to take advantage of our work, our Planetary Health Summit that is happening, a global Planetary Health Summit is happening for the first time in Asia. I had to negotiate for it to come out of Harvard and Stanford and mm -hmm. Edinburgh to say, where is impacting people is also in my region, and we have so much to share with you that you might learn from. So we will be having this in April next year. We invite that an a dis, a ongoing discussion on this carries on at our summit, and invite all of you to carry on the discussions and listen to vo voices from that region as well. And I think only then, if we make this a global movement that wants to see change, will we see the change. And I. As I said, I'm a determined optimist. If I urge you to watch one film, and it's called 2040, made by an Australian f filmmaker, Damon Gano. And it's a very simple film. He made it for his daughter, who was three and a half years old. And he said, I want to make a film for her, so that when she, in 2040, what will life be for her if we use the technology and knowledge we have today? It is one of the most inspiring films I've seen. It made me realize it is possible for us to solve some of the biggest challenges we have in the world. If we have the ability to suspend our inhibitions and reimagine a world that is better. And that means we have to have the audacity of hope and we have to communicate that hope and that vision so clearly that everybody wants to get to that point. Dr. Jamala, Dr. Mahmoud, Lisa, tremendous, tremendous words. And for me, you both 
exemplify in your biographies people that are exactly crossing, connecting dots, crossing, bringing down barriers, and now you even brought in uh, culture and, and Taylor Swift before and uh, K-pop, and because it's about action at every level. So please join me in truly applauding and, 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 and giving, giving you recognition for what you're doing and the words that you gave us today. Thank you, everybody.